Hello, everyone. Welcome to the China Brief. We bring you the latest global media coverage on China's current affairs, economy, and society, as well as exclusive analysis. Our trustworthy, professional, and multi-perspective China reporting provides judgment and decision-making references for the world's elites. The China Brief is issued in multiple languages, including text, video, podcasts, and books, and is broadcasted 24/7 in the six-degree world. Welcome to this edition of China Briefing, where we bring you the latest news on China's politics, economy, and society from the global media, as well as exclusive expert analysis. If you find our content helpful, please subscribe to our newsletter. Four things to watch for at Biden's Camp David summit. The Washington Post reports that President Biden will host the leaders of Japan and South Korea at Camp David on Friday. Marking the first time a U.S. president has hosted foreign officials at the resort in Katokti Mountain, Maryland, and the first-ever standalone summit of three countries. Historically, both Japan and South Korea have been close allies of the United States, but maintain considerable animosity toward each other, largely due to Japan's domination of South Korea. The leaders of the two countries are expected to increase cooperation on national security and mutual defense, rather than creating a NATO-like alliance. They will also discuss economic security, with a focus on supporting supply chains for key technologies such as semiconductors and electric car batteries. There are concerns that Biden's inflation-cutting bill and bills to spur investment in the U.S., such as the Chips Act, could negatively impact domestic industries in South Korea and Japan. Leaders will also consider the 2024 election and its impact on the alliance. Finally, the summit will be closely watched by Japan and South Korea's largest trading partner, China, which has denounced the summit as an effort to create a mini NATO. Here is the China briefing. Why is China making a big push for patriotic education? The German Wave reports that China has submitted a draft of a new patriotic education bill to the legislature, aimed at reinforcing patriotism and loyalty to the Communist Party in all aspects of the lives of Chinese youth. The legislation would require patriotic education in schools, religious groups, businesses and even families. It also lists penalties for offenses such as insulting the national flag. Critics see it as an attempt to brainwash the younger generation. The move comes at a time when China is facing domestic and international challenges, and observers believe the Communist Party leadership sees young Chinese as a threat to its power and legitimacy. Here's the China briefing. At Camp David, Biden aims to push Japan and South Korea for greater unity in complex Pacific region. President Joe Biden used a summit with the leaders of Japan and South Korea to urge them to strengthen ties and turn the page on their shared difficult history, the Independent reports. The summit, held at the Camp David Presidential Resort, was aimed at further strengthening security and economic ties between the two countries. Historically, South Korea-Japan relations have been chilly due to differing views on the history of World War II and Japan's colonial rule of the Korean Peninsula. However, over the past year, relations between the two countries have thawed rapidly due to concerns over both China's assertiveness in the Pacific and North Korea's nuclear threat. The leaders are expected to announce a joint effort to institutionalize cooperation between the three countries, including plans to expand military cooperation in ballistic defense and technology development. The White House hopes the current rapprochement provides an opportunity for a historic shift in relations. The summit, held at Camp David, was intended to demonstrate the importance of relations with South Korea and Japan and to signal a greater foreign policy focus on the Pacific. Here's the China briefing. Li Chang says China must meet annual economic targets, pursue domestic momentum. The South China Morning Post reports that Chinese Premier Li Chang emphasized the need to achieve the country's annual economic targets at a state council meeting. The news comes after China confirmed weak economic data for July, which is expected to pose a challenge to Beijing's annual targets. China's economy is struggling to sustain its recovery from the Xian Guan epidemic, with investor and consumer confidence faltering, the real estate market in the doldrums, mounting local debt and rising financial risks. Many investment banks have lowered their growth expectations due to the weak data. The People's Bank of China also cut interest rates to support the economy. 
here is the China briefing. EU's China policy needs to be adjusted, but there is no one-size-fits-all solution. The South China Morning Post, SCMP, reports that the EU's current strategy towards China is ineffective, with the main challenges coming from within the EU. The EU's complex governance structure makes it difficult to reach consensus on key China-related issues. The EU has issued a number of directives and policies, causing confusion among member states. The Global Gateway Program, launched in 2021 as a response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, lacks clarity and funding. There are also policy differences within the EU, with different parties taking different positions on China. In addition, member states have very different attitudes toward China, making it difficult for Beijing to know who to deal with. The growing strategic competition between China and the US also complicates the EU's policy toward China. To develop a clearer strategy toward China, the EU should focus on economics and trade, avoid political issues, and seek a more unified strategy among member states. This is China Briefing. Exclusive, Dolly and Wanda Considering Sale of Olympic Media Rights Manager Ing Fang, Sources Dolly and Wanda Group is considering selling its sports marketing arm, Ing Fang Sports Media, in a bid to improve its financial position, Reuters reports. The Chinese real estate developer has hired Deutsche Bank to advise on the sale, which is still in its early stages. Private equity firms are said to be interested in Ing Fang and are likely to seek a well-funded buyer due to the minimum guarantees required for sports broadcasting rights. Pinnacle's activities include managing the international media rights for the Italian Serie A and the English Premier League. Here's the China Briefing. China's high-tech hub Suzhou targets live e-commerce development. The South China Morning Post, SCMP, reports that the Chinese city of Suzhou has introduced measures to promote live streaming e-commerce activity, including financial subsidies of up to 1 million yuan, US dollars, for individual live streaming hosts with annual sales of more than 50 million yuan and who pay taxes in the city. Local authorities will also offer incentives of up to 1.2 million renminbi to Chinese multi-channel networks that sign exclusive contracts with popular live streamers with annual sales of more than 100 million renminbi. Last year, Suzhou's live streaming e-commerce sales amounted to 55 billion yuan, up 79.2% year-on-year. Here's the China briefing. China tries to figure out who a hit song is mocking. The Economist reports that Chinese singer Naiflang has released a new song titled, The City of Rakshasa Sea, which has caused a stir in China. The song's cryptic lyrics have sparked speculation about who the artist is mocking. Some see it as an attack on Naiflang's critics, while others see it as a critique of society. The song's popularity and cryptic message has led to countless comments and discussions from listeners. Naiflang himself has remained silent on the meaning of the song. This is China Briefing. Two Narratives of Surviving and Fleeing China's Repression The Economist reports that two new memoirs by Uyghur exiles Tahir Hamid Izgil and Gulchara Hoja detail life outside the detention camps in Xinjiang. Izgil's memoir, Waiting to be Arrested at Night, focuses on 2014-17, when Xinjiang became a state-controlled circular prison. Koja's memoir, A Stone is Most Precious Where It Belongs, begins with her childhood and details her experiences as a journalist in Xinjiang. Both memoirs shed light on the Uyghur experience and their suffering under Chinese oppression. Here's the China Brief. Taking aim at China, U.S. tech nationalism only burns hotter. Recent U.S. restrictions on investment in Chinese high-tech companies are part of a broader strategy to slow China's technological rise, writes Patrick Kurniawan in the South China Morning Post. The U.S. government's policies are protectionist and will hurt U.S. tech companies, while China prioritizes reducing its dependence on foreign technology imports. Kurniawan argues that the U.S. is prioritizing containment of China over preserving its identity as a defender of the free market system. Here's the China briefing. Hedge fund EDL says China's yuan devaluation could be the market's next black swan event. Hedge fund EDL Capital is betting on a further devaluation of China's offshore currency, the renminbi, which it says could be the next 
black swan event to disrupt world markets, according to an investor briefing seen by Reuters. Factors weighing on the yuan include geopolitical tensions, declining competitiveness in the labor market, a weak recovery from the pandemic and the possibility of lower-than-expected foreign exchange reserves, EDL Capital said. The hedge fund has a short position in the offshore yuan and may use derivatives called options to profit from a stronger dollar and weaker yuan. Here's the China briefing. China and Belarus seek closer military ties. The German Wave reports that Chinese Defense Minister Li Shangfu visited Belarus to strengthen military cooperation between the two countries. The purpose of the visit was to implement important agreements at the level of the two heads of state and to further strengthen military cooperation between the two countries. The two sides agreed to increase military exercises next year, but did not provide specific details about the enhanced security cooperation. Belarus relies on military assistance from China and Russia. Shanfu's trip comes at a time when both China and Belarus are facing worrisome diplomatic relations with the West. China has been criticized for its military exercises near Taiwan and its treatment of the Uyghur minority, while Belarus has been the target of Western sanctions for aiding Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Here's the China briefing. NDP MPs and Beijing critics call on Ottawa to quickly launch foreign agent registration. The CBC reports that NDP MP Jenny Kwan and other Chinese critics are urging the Canadian government to enact foreign agent registration legislation to protect the next federal election. The Liberal government launched a public consultation on the registry in March and plans to introduce a bill later this year. Critics say the government has been slow to respond to Beijing-backed interference in previous federal elections. The government is currently negotiating with opposition parties over the terms of reference for a public inquiry into foreign interference. Another petition has also been circulated expressing concerns about racial profiling. Here's the China briefing. Rising number of new crown cases and variants in China raise fears of third wave. The South China Morning Post SCMP, reports a slight uptick in COVID-19 cases in China, prompting speculation about a possible third wave of infections. The increase in cases has been attributed to a decline in immunity in people previously infected with the virus. In addition, there is concern about the emergence of the EG.5 variant, which is able to evade antibodies developed against earlier variants and vaccines. However, Public health experts insist that the risk of serious illness and death from COVID-19 in China remains low. The World Health Organization has classified the EG.5 variant as a variant of interest, but assesses its global health risk as low. Here's the China briefing. Beijing says Yuan has bright future, blames short-term pressure for devaluation. The South China Morning Post, SCMP, reports that Beijing said the recent depreciation of the yuan was due to short-term pressures and that the yuan was solidly supported by economic fundamentals. The yuan is now about 6.9% weaker against the dollar than it was a year ago, and the depreciation has raised concerns about capital outflows and China's growth prospects. Beijing claims to have a strong toolbox to stabilize the yuan and wants to employ a flexible yuan exchange rate to absorb external shocks. Here's the China briefing. How serious is China's economic slowdown? The Peterson Institute for International Economics reports that many economists and analysts agree that the current slowdown in China is due to flawed policymaking and will have a negative impact on the global economy. However, this assessment may be premature and incorrect. While it is true that China is facing a number of challenges such as declining productivity and a shrinking labor force, a careful reading of the current situation does not support the view that China's economic growth is in a serious downward spiral. China's overall year-on-year -year growth rate of 6.3% in the second quarter of 2023 was below investor expectations. However, this was in part due to weaker growth in the second quarter of 2022. Household consumption expansion also declined in the second quarter, but this was the result of weak consumption growth in the previous quarter coupled with the lifting of the new crown epidemic embargo. It was a one-off event. Imports weakened, but in volume terms they grew by 1%, suggesting growing domestic demand. 
Contrary to the view that households are losing confidence and cutting back on spending, the data show that per capita consumption grew by 8.4% in the first half of 2023, outpacing growth in disposable income per capita. Growth in per capita wages and other sources of income also suggests that households' share of output is rising. Falling retail prices could lead to a delay in consumption, but it is too early to imply deflation based on just one month of data. Private investment weakened in the first half of 2023 due to tighter regulation of internet companies and real estate adjustments. However, regulators have recently said that problems with the financial activities of internet companies have been rectified and real estate investment is unlikely to recover. Overall, while China's recovery is fragile, there are signs that it has begun. Here's the China briefing. How China's economic turmoil could hurt your portfolio. CNN reports that China's economic slowdown could negatively impact the U.S. stock market and global economic growth. Consumer spending, factory production and long-term investment have all slowed in China. Tensions are also rising between the U.S. and China, with President Joe Biden recently restricting U.S. investment in China's advanced technology sectors. U.S. companies with operations in China, such as Apple, Intel, Ford and Tesla, could be negatively impacted. Large hedge funds and private equity firms are already cutting back on investments in Chinese companies. Here's the China briefing. Two new polls show Biden's immigration support slipping further. The Center for Immigration Studies reports that two recent polls by Reuters, Ipsos and Fox News show that Americans' dissatisfaction with President Biden's handling of immigration issues is growing. The poll was conducted after an expected surge in immigration in the wake of Section 42 failed to materialize, but apprehensions at the southwest border increased by about a third in July. The Biden administration has yet to release official border data for the last month. President Biden initially retained the CDC order under Section 42, which directed the deportation of illegal immigrants in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, in January, a Section 42 death warrant was signed, and there were fears that illegal immigration would spike once the CDC order was lifted. The post-Section 42 wave did not develop initially, leading to a slight increase in President Biden's approval ratings. However, recent reports indicate that a surge in immigration is occurring, leading to a growing disapproval of the president's immigration policies. Recent polls show that President Biden's disapproval of immigration is on the rise. In a Reuters Ipsos poll, 57% of respondents disapproved of the way Biden is handling immigration, while only 28% approved. The Fox News poll showed an even higher disapproval rating, with 62% of respondents disapproving of Biden's handling of immigration. The Biden administration's delay in releasing July's border data also raised suspicions that they may be trying to hide bad news. Overall, the poll shows that concerns about illegal immigration on the southwest border are concentrated on the center-right to right of the political spectrum. However, the issue is likely to gain more attention as the 2024 presidential election approaches, with Republican candidates expected to focus on the way Biden has handled immigration. Unless things improve, the ongoing border crisis could provide an opportunity for Republican candidates in 2024, but a Biden administration is unlikely to change its border policy. Here's the China briefing. Morgan Stanley cuts China's 2023 growth forecast to 4.7%. The Globe and Mail reports that Morgan Stanley has lowered its forecast for China's economic growth this year to 4.7%, down from 5% previously. The bank also cut its 2024 GDP forecast to 4.2% from 4.5%. This comes after China released a series of disappointing data and sparked concerns about its real estate sector. JP Morgan and Barclays also recently cut their forecasts for China's GDP growth. China's real estate sector has been facing a liquidity crunch since the collapse of the country's Evergrande Group in 2021, and fears of a contagion of the crisis have intensified with the insolvency of BGI. Here's the China briefing. China's central bank says it will keep policy, precise and powerful, to help recovery. Reuters reports that the People's Bank of China, 
PBOC, said it will maintain a reasonably abundant level of liquidity and implement precise and powerful policies to support economic recovery. The central bank recently cut interest rates and launched direct stimulus measures to try to revive growth. The central bank also said it would adjust and optimize its real estate policy to deal with the deepening crisis in the property market. The bank also warned that China faces challenges such as lack of demand and difficult and risky business operations. Here's the China briefing. Central bank, Chinese banks should maintain appropriate levels of profitability. Reuters reports that China's central bank said commercial banks need to maintain appropriate levels of profits and net interest margins to support the real economy. The PBOC noted that banks' net interest margins and return on total assets are on a downward trend due to lower lending rates. The central bank emphasized the important role of banks in serving the real economy and ensuring a smooth economic and financial cycle. It also emphasized the need for banks to have financial capacity and risk buffers to mitigate credit risk. The central bank said fluctuations in banks' profitability with the economic cycle are normal and should be treated rationally. Here's the China briefing. AIIB's former head of communications on why he blew the whistle. The Economist reports that Bob Pickard, the former head of global communications at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, has written an article detailing his time at the bank. Pickard claims that the AIIB, which was established by China in 2016, is not as apolitical and independent as it claims to be. He claimed that the bank was influenced by the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, and that members of the CCP held key positions within the bank. Picard said he was condemned by ADB President Jean LeCun for making statements that contradicted the party line of China's zero new crown policy. He also claimed that the bank's message was designed for a Chinese and British audience and that Mr. Jean received guidance from the Chinese Communist Party. Picard further claimed that the bank operates under a culture of surveillance, that members are monitored and scrutinized, and that members of the CCP wield a great deal of power within the organization. Picard's allegations were made after he resigned from the ADB in May 2023, citing concerns about CCP influence within the bank. After his resignation, the bank conducted an internal investigation, which concluded that Picard's allegations were baseless. In response to the article, pro-communist Twitter accounts hurled insults and accusations at Pickard. Canada has suspended its membership in the ADB to review its participation in the organization. Here's the China brief. Ant Group's Alipay expands support for Visa, MasterCard, and other major credit cards. The South China Morning Post reports that Ant Group's digital payment service Alipay has updated the international interface of its app to support international travelers to China. The update allows users to make credit card purchases via Visa, MasterCard, Diners Club, Discover and JCB. The move is aimed at supporting overseas travelers visiting China ahead of the 2023 Asian Games in Hangzhou. The update also includes multiple language options, translation tools and integration with travel services such as hotel and flight bookings. The move is part of China's efforts to make it easier for foreign tourists to integrate into a cashless society. Here's the China briefing. What's behind China's strategic partnership with Georgia? The Carnegie Endowment reports that the signing of a strategic partnership agreement between China and Georgia highlights China's attempts to expand its influence in the South Caucasus. The document, which was signed during Georgian Prime Minister Irakli Garibashvili's visit to China, outlines plans to strengthen economic and political cooperation as well as infrastructure and educational cooperation. For China, closer ties with Georgia could pave the way for expanded influence in the South Caucasus, a region traditionally seen as part of Russia's sphere of influence. The partnership could also be viewed through the lens of Central Asia, as China looks to build east-west connectivity through railroads, roads, and trade in the region. Georgia has multiple reasons to revitalize its relationship with China, including Russia's continued occupation of two Georgian territories and its bid for EU candidate status. However, the Strategic Cooperation Agreement does not guarantee greater Chinese influence in Georgia, which remains a major partner of the United States and the European Union. 
The agreement could also further exacerbate tensions between China, Russia, and the West in the region. Here's the China briefing. China's economic downturn causes smartphone sales to fall to lowest level in a decade. The Telegraph reports that CounterPoint Research expects global smartphone sales to fall 6% this year to 1.15 billion units, the lowest since 2013. Economic pressures in China have weakened consumer spending on electronics, leading to a slowdown that is affecting the wider Asia-Pacific region. The drop in sales was not offset by lower inflation in the US. The slowdown in smartphone sales comes at a time when global PC sales are at similarly low levels, raising concerns about an overall consumer tech slowdown. Apple, one of the world's largest smartphone makers, has begun shifting production from China to countries such as India and Vietnam. Here's the China briefing. Beijing appears to be building a runway on disputed South China Sea Island. China is building a runway on the disputed South China Sea territory of Triton Island, which Vietnam also has sovereignty over, according to the South China Morning Post. Satellite images show construction of the airport began in mid-July. Triton Island is the southernmost and westernmost island in the Paracel Islands, which Vietnam and Taiwan also claim sovereignty over. China has a history of building military facilities on disputed islands in the South China Sea, which has sparked accusations of militarization of the region. The new airport is much shorter than others built by China, limiting the size of the warplanes that can use it. Here's the China briefing. China says it welcomes U.S. Commerce Secretary's visit to China after investment controls are imposed. The Independent reports that China has expressed its willingness to welcome U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo to China following the imposition of foreign investment controls by the U.S. Department of Commerce. The two countries are reportedly in close communication about arranging the visit, which could take place later this month. The visit comes after U.S. President Joe Biden signed an executive order blocking and regulating U.S. high-tech investments in China, focusing on advanced computer chips, microelectronics, quantum information technology and artificial intelligence. The order is intended to protect national security interests while maintaining the broader trade relationship between the two countries. China has said it will fully assess the impact of the executive order and will take necessary countermeasures accordingly. Despite the geopolitical tensions between the two countries, China seems to be more willing to engage with the U.S. on economic issues. Here's the China briefing. China's high hopes for artificial intelligence and Vietnam's new cyber crackdown. Nikkei Asia reports that China's real estate crisis is starting to affect the country's tech sector, with companies like Tencent and Alibaba reporting slowing growth and weak demand in key areas. To combat this, Tencent plans to launch its own generative artificial intelligence, AI, base model this year, aiming to incorporate it into a variety of businesses such as public services, tourism and finance. Meanwhile, Alibaba is developing large-scale language models on which tech companies can build their own AI-based tools, such as apps. The company's chief executive officer, Zhang Yong, said this approach is different from its competitors, which build AI tools for specific domains and industry applications. China's three state-owned telecoms operators, China Mobile, China Telecom and China Unicom, are also looking to promote their own cloud services, with each reporting double-digit year-on-year growth in cloud revenue for the first half of 2019. Here's the China briefing. Negotiations with China can't be broken on an individual basis. Foreign policy reports that the Biden administration's strategy of compartmentalizing China issues and seeking cooperation in specific areas has proven futile. China's concept of hyperwarfare, including cyber warfare, economic coercion, and media infiltration, undermines the potential for fragmentation. China's goal is to undermine the U.S.'s ability and willingness to counter China, and will ride the coattails of existing hegemonies to solve common problems without offering much cooperation in return. China's ambitions to establish hierarchical regional hegemony and exercise authoritarian global leadership make cooperation on issues that undermine the common good impossible. Unlike the United States, China seeks to regain its global hegemony primarily out of a sense of historical accomplishment rather than for material gain. As long as China retains its top spot, 
it is willing to accept a less prosperous and less stable world. China's relations with allies such as North Korea and Russia suggest that it intends to use these allies as pawns to pursue its own interests and divide its transatlantic allies. Instead of granting China a sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific, the United States should respond to China's all-out competition with a comprehensive strategy that capitalizes on the asymmetric advantages of alliances. The idea of compartmentalization hinges on the false assumption that China thinks and acts like the United States. This is China Briefing. Democracy and the Cost of Voting Economists and protesters may not seem to have much in common, but both groups tend to advocate for democracy, reports The Economist. Studies have shown that democracies favor economic growth. Countries with established elections and related institutions tend to have competent finance ministers, trustworthy governments, and reliable legal systems. In fact, one study found that 25 years after moving from dictatorship to democracy, a country's GDP was one-fifth higher. However, the transition to democracy takes longer and costs more than is often thought. In the 25 years following the transition to democracy, countries lost an average of 20% of their GDP per capita, in part because they struggled with the transition. There are now more intermediate regimes than ever before, with 87 countries falling into this category. While credible institutions are necessary for development, democratic institutions take time to build. They take decades to develop civil services, legal systems, charities, universities and investor confidence. In addition, political reforms can disrupt the economy and create risks for businesses and investors. Elections are costly and the NDP often relies on crony capitalist networks for funding and protection. Corruption is also a major concern, as new leaders may resort to corrupt practices to maintain power. The democratization process is fraught with challenges, which helps to explain why full democracy remains elusive in many countries.